my um, contribution this afternoon, unlike some of the others, uh, will be to attack your religion. Uh, don't get worried, though. I'm not going to declare war on any of the world's major spiritual and religious traditions, those practiced in churches and synagogues and mosques and temples. But the religion that I'm going to attack may be uh, dearer to your heart and more closely entwined with your longings and a uh, quest for uh, transcendence. Uh, it's practiced around the globe in new temples and new cathedrals. Uh, philosophers and scholars of rhetoric point to the significance of what they call God terms, concepts that have a certain uh, inherent potency. They sweep up whole periods of history, nations and cultures, striving for a higher state. Uh, in the late 18th and throughout the 19th century, one of these God terms was revolution. Always popular in the United States is the God term of the frontier. And over the decades, this term, this concept, was continually redefined. Where the frontier was, what its significant was, significance was, changed over time. But in the American experience, there was always a new frontier for which we were striving. Uh, today's God term, today's religion, identifies an object of worship in universities, think tanks, corporations, on Wall Street, and in the dreams of our social elites. Today's God term is widely associated with creativity, ingenuity, success, wealth, fame, personal virtue, national prosperity, and cultural vitality. <clears throat> so these are all good things. These are what I would say for many people, this is the source of our spiritual and object of our spiritual longings. So now it's time for the revelation. Can you guess its name? What is the name of this new God term, this new religion of our time? Innovation. Innovation. <laughs> Innovation. Innovation. Okay. A little musical interlude there. Uh, had Handel been writing today, it wouldn't have been hallelujah. It would have been innovation, I'm sure. It, the term comes from the Latin innovari, which means to renew. So it's an inherently good concept, which is why we are uh, attracted to it. And I share with you the uh, belief that innovation is good, uh, well worth pursuing. One of my favorite inno uh, innovators was Miles Davis, a man who invented and brought to perfection not one, but several styles of playing jazz. And he was notable for when he w had gotten to the point of perfection, he moved on to the next idea. He was a, uh, a great innovator. So we associate innovation with the unconventional, the exploratory, the bold, the restless, the boundary breaking, the risk taking, never satisfied with, uh, with mediocrity. And in today's uh, universities, including this one, we have centers and departments and programs, research projects that have innovation as their central purpose. You know this. You live this. Uh, so, for example, on, this Rensselaer, on the Rensselaer campus, we have the Center for Industrial Innovation. I myself wor work in two uh, uh, 
related programs, design, innovation, and society, product design and innovation. So I also practice this religion. I am an innovationist, I fully uh, confess. So I said I was going to attack this new religion. And as they might say in Brooklyn, so what's not to like? Well, there are many things, but I'm going to emphasize two today, things that I have serious questions about. One is that innovation has become a code word for projects that are often uh, flagrantly conventional. Making products, systems, and services aimed at the most wealthy, the most overserved consumers and organizations on the planet. If you think about what counts as innovation in this world, that's a lot of what it is. Uh, to give you some examples here, we have uh, the Audi self-parking car. Very often, innovations take something old and tired out, and they try to make it new and interesting. So with the Audi, let's say you're at a convention in Las Vegas. You're in a, in a parking structure. You've got a tight squeeze. What you can do is get out of the car, push a button, and the car will park itself. This is innovation uh, as popularly known. In, in many cases, you have innovations that come not just as single objects, but as whole genres, whole projects. So right now, we're all getting excited about the Internet of Things. This is a major thrust of innovation, but that isn't good enough. We also have people now talking about the Internet of Caring Things. So in a society that seems to care less and less, we'll have things that care more and more including this one here, uh, cup time. The plastic cup connects with a wire, wirelessly to a cell phone, allowing consumers to monitor their, waste, their, uh, their water intake. You could also just watch and observe what you're uh, drinking, but, <laughs> but that, that would not be innovative, and we all, we all want to be uh, innovative. So I find it impressive to see such ingenuity and devotion lavished upon projects like these. Yet I have to wonder, I think we should all wonder, uh, what era are we living in as we pursue the, these objects of uh, veneration? Um, will this be known as the era of apps and abs? Seems to me that's likely. I woke up the other day like this is my Charlton Heston moment. And I said to myself, I'm living on the planet of the apps. <laughs> so part of my argument would be that uh, innovation takes up the mantle of really developments that happened 80 years ago. The great tradition from the 1930s. That is consumerism as a solution for the crisis of overproduction, uh, strategies of planned obsolescence, the yearly model changes, uh, <clears throat> themes like the streamlined vacuum cleaner that, of course, as you're vacuuming, reduces air friction. or whole product lines from the 1930s. There's a satisfied uh, consumer. And in our time, a worried nation cries out. You've heard this cry. It's already been six months Where's the new iPhone? <laughs> so we're impatient for the kinds of <clears throat> uh, developments that were deeply ingrained in our culture about 70, 80 years ago. And I would argue that innovation is still in this stream. So in the probably apocryphal words of the religious figure, uh, St. Stephen the Innovator, where the need is least, there ye shall find them. So what's not to like? The second point that I want to talk about, more, much more serious. Thinking outside the box. Thinking as an innovator. Leads us to believe that there's lots of time 
needed, for needed changes to occur. And that the best solutions are to be found in new knowledge, not old knowledge, in new devices that are out there in the distance. This is, this is what we believe. This is the, the subject of our uh, deepest longings. So faced with a world of urgent problems, I think it's time to ask the question, is innovation the best we've got? And for many people, I think the answer is yes. Here's some typical questions. Uh, will we innovate ourselves out of the glaring gaps of inequality that afflict the U.S. and many other world societies? Is that something that innovation will do for us? Will we innovate ourselves away from utter dependence upon fossil fuels, the ones upon which modern civilization depends? Will we innovate in ways that remove rapidly moving threat to global warming poses to our civilization and countless biological species? Three questions about major problems that face the world today. And I would say, not likely. But we believe that's the best path. Many of us believe. So while innovative technologies could play a role, needed now, I think more urgently, is resolved to take action on the matters of most urgency in the world today, to do that directly and quickly as matters of ethics, politics, and policy. And you can see the failure of resolve, the failure to act, act again and again in our society, particularly in Washington, D.C., for God's sake. For example, in the pathetic breakthrough at Copenhagen in 2009, where the world leaders came together to discuss climate change and came up with nothing. And they really haven't come up with much ever since. So innovation is often the name for a strategy premised upon evasion and delay. That's the, that's the code name for this strategy. So a popular incantation is, with wonderful innovations in renewable energy produced over several decades, world societies will reduce the burning of fossil fuels, curtail CO2 emissions, and bring climate change under control. <clears throat> if you read the subtext of a lot of presentations and articles, this is what they believe. Innovation will do this for us. But the, the, the real message underlying it all is don't act now, let's say don't act, by imposing a steep carbon tax and drive those carbon emissions down right now, starting tomorrow morning. Just wait, innovate, and look to the future. So this is also part of a, a religious tradition, which is expecting miracles in the future. So question is, do we have time? I've listed some of the findings of a recent UN uh, climate change report. In the last month or so, almost daily in the New York Times, you see reports and studies and findings, international and national, that say, we're running out of time. We maybe have a decade to really drive those carbon emissions down, or the consequences will be horrible, uh, and that the cost of, of <clears throat> addressing them later will become absolutely prohibitive. So an embarrassing question, is our actual practice innovation or evasion? If spoken quickly, the words have a very similar pronunciation. So I teach in the product, uh, program in product design and innovation. But if you speak a little more quickly, it might sound like product design innovation. 
Uh, we have the Global Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, but it might be the Global Center for Entrepreneurship and Evasion, which I think might be nearer to the truth. So I want to end this uh, brief talk with a modest proposal, something positive and helpful. You can see looking around the room that not all of you are, uh, are convinced. But I think uh, one thing that would be helpful at this point would be to have a prize, like the Nobel Prize for medicine or for physics, uh, every year uh, in innovation, a, uh, a prize. So my proposal would be to have the Nero Prize, named after the uh, ancient emperor in the first century, emperor of Rome, Nero, um, renowned for fiddling while Rome burned. And so the prize would be given for the year's most absurd innovation. I'll get to some of those in a second, but I might, might just say that uh, uh, <clears throat> Nero didn't fiddle because the violin had not yet been invented in his time. So if he played anything at all, he pro probably played the lyre. Right. But he was probably a great innovator because he evidently found ways to uh, make marble burn uh, quickly. Um, so I read the same sites that you do, you know, Life Hacker, Mashable, Gizmodo, and so forth. And the award for this year's Nero Prize, I can tell you, is intense. There are lots of qualified uh, applicants, uh, nom nominees. Uh, here's one of them. <laughs> Google Glass, the one I like best, is the one that would be a contact lens, you know. But if you think about this, this nominee for uh, the Nero Prize, um, there are privacy concerns that arise. The glasses lit literally let you video record people without their permission, often without their knowledge. So another nominee in the running for the Nero this year is the anti-Google Glass defense system. <laughs> uh, I happen to know the inventor of this uh, device, but I'm not allowed to, to mention his name. So again, the, uh, my message is that thinking outside the box is the new box. Going back to the religious theme, it seems to me one can even identify a major problem here. In medieval Christi Christianity, there was much writing and speculation about the seven deadly sins. Here you have the Hieronymus Bosch painting of the seven sins. So my question is, does this new religion involve, crucially, the sin of pride? That was one of the seven <coughs> deadly sins. Pride is an inflated sense of one's standing or accomplishments. So can one look squarely at the prospects for world civilization in the decades ahead and smile with pride? Seems to me that's uh, rather, rather problematic these days. So in conclusion, yes, it is good to pursue your dreams, realize your creativity, and innovate using your best talents and abilities. I want you to do that. I encourage you to go down that path. But even above that, remember your responsibilities to humanity and our planet. Thank you.